Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today to the webinar called Welcoming Newly Arrived Refugees in the Classroom. According to the UNCHR, uh, more than 5.4 million refugees have fled Ukraine since the war start, and mostly women and children. These families have joined the thousands of already refugees and migrants that at upon, upon their arrival were also welcome in the European classrooms. The challenges are important and urgent to be effectively tackled. That is why from the School Education Gateway, the major educational portal of the European Commission, where you will find a carefully selected resources and information relevant, have organized uh, this webinar uh, today. In this, uh, in the School Education Gateway, you can also find uh, the European Toolkit for the Schools, where you will find concrete resources for improving the collaboration within, between, and beyond the schools, with the view of enabling all children and young people to succeed in a school. When a schools and other educational institutions welcome migrants and newly arrived refugees, classrooms become more culturally diverse. Quite often, this diversity, understood in a very wide sense, goes unnoticed or even it is perceived as a problem or as a challenge that teachers are expected to solve. If institutional support structures and how to teach in a diverse classroom are fragile, teachers tend to act in accordance with their own views and pedagogical experience. That sometimes can be also a challenge. When dealing with a culturally diverse classroom, good intentions are not always enough, and rather often pedagogical approaches that emerge from teachers' genuine concerns with their pupils ends up having detrimental effects on their learning and well-being. That is why we need to draw from uh, well-contrasted experience, from research, and this is what this webinar is about. And here uh, we are going to discuss the importance of acknowledging and most importantly, valuing and recognizing cultural diversity in the classroom, while tending to the complex needs of refugee children. So, in doing so, we have uh, four speakers that are going to be uh, with us uh, today. Uh, the first one will be Cosmin Nada, who is an expert on diversity in education and a researcher at the Center for Research and Intervention in Education in Oporto, who will approach the distinction between intercultural and monocultural teachers, highlighting the importance of adapting pedagogical practices to the needs of diverse pupils. Whilst under acknowledging that all pupils are different in their own way, particularly vulnerable groups like refugee children require extra attention. Sara Amadasi uh, will follow, uh, and she's a research fellow in the Department of Studies and Language and Culture at UNIMOR and representative of the Horizon 2020 Child App project that will uh, present how dialogic facilitation can be a tool to promote migrant children's participation in the classroom and to enhance conditions of hybrid integrations, which concerns all children. Going from Italy to Slovenia, uh, we will hear the experience of another Horizon 2020 project by the hand of Matija Setmak and Barbara Gornik from the Science and Research Center of COPER and representatives of the MeCreate project, who will be presenting the main findings and recommendations together with a series of practical and concrete tools that teachers can use in the process of welcoming refugees children in teaching in diverse classrooms. So now we are going to give the floor to Cosmin uh, Yonut Nada. Uh, the floor is yours, Cosmin. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for being uh, here on a Friday afternoon. I apologize already for my voice uh, because I, I was sick for a few days and I'm still not fully recovered, but I hope that you can all hear me well. Um, I'm going to, to share uh, my presentation now so that we are uh, on the same page. And here it is. I believe that you are able to, to see it well. 
And uh, today I would like to, to reflect uh, with you and uh, for us to reflect together on the issue of diversity in education. A very brief uh, presentation that uh, Teresa already made um, that I come from from the Center for Research and Intervention in Education from the University of, uh, of Porto. Um, I also act as a member of the editorial board of the European Toolkit for Schools, the, the main um, uh, organizer for today's uh, uh, webinar, which is hosted on the School Education Gateway. Uh, and I also coordinate the NESET network, the net network of experts working on the social dimension of education and training. And today I'm going to draw mainly on my experience as a lecturer of um, the elective course Diversity in Education, Migration and Multiculturalism that I teach at my university for the bachelor degree in educational sciences. Um, I would like us to, to start uh, our discussion today from, from this short uh, excerpt uh, by, uh, by a text uh, from Dina Nairi called Ungrateful Refugee, which was published um, in the Guardian newspaper. Um, and Dina shares with us her experience of being a six-year-old migrant. And she mentions, in 1985, when I was six years old, my family left our home in East Hafan for several months to live in London. The move was temporary, a half-hearted stab at emigration. Nonetheless, I was enrolled in school. In Iran, I had only attended nursery, never school, and I spoke only Farsi. At first, the children were welcoming, teaching me English words using toys and pictures. But within days, the atmosphere around me had changed. Years later, I figured that this must have been how long it took them to tell their parents about the Iranian kid. After that, a group of boys met me in the yard each morning and pretended to play, pummeled me in the stomach. They followed me in the playground and shouted gibberish, laughing at my dumbfounded looks. A few weeks later, two older boys pushed my hand into a door jump and slammed it shut on my little finger, severing it at the first segment. I was rushed to the hospital, carrying a piece of my finger in a paper napkin. The segment was successfully reattached. Um, this is, uh, I believe, uh, an excerpt that doesn't require much, uh, much comments from us. It's just a little bit to, to set the tone of, of our discussion and to, to reflect about the, what, what can be the experience of, of a mi migrant uh, child of a six-year-old in, in a European school in this uh, particular case. So about refugee children and young people in education, uh, we are going to talk uh, uh, in detail today. And we have, as Teresa mentioned already, compiled um, um, a series of relevant resources that you can use. And we are going to share the links in the chat uh, as well. But I would like to bring the discussion a little bit uh, uh, backwards in this sense and take a, step, take a step back and reflect. And I think we can reflect on the issue of diversity in education more broadly. And in order to do that, I'm bringing you a video from Brazil, an example that we can use. And this video is focused on medicalization of childhood and education, which is not the topic of our discussion, but you will see it's very relevant to think the issue of diversity in education. And we are not going to watch the video because it is in Portuguese with no subtitles, but I'm going to uh, briefly describe what we can see in this video. So we have the teacher that you can see depicted here in this uh, image that sits at her desk and starts reading the names of some of her students one by one and describing them. And she goes on telling us, Julio, he has mental health issues. He is being treated. I discussed his case with a psychologist and I didn't understand exactly what is wrong with him, but it's mental health issues, she tells us. Then she goes on, Desio, his main problem is memory and I think he would need a neurologist. Actually, many children here would urgently need a neurologist. Edilson is another case who needs a professional, perhaps a psychologist to run some tests and figure out what is wrong with him because the boy's mood shifts all the time. It seems like his personality is unstable. And it gets even worse. Mauricea, as I understood, she has some health issues, but she's the type of child who, in this teacher's opinion, is never going to learn. Pedro is very rebellious. He has a very aggressive personality. He's unhappy. He's angry. And she says, I think the problem is the family because I heard that all the family is like that. 
and the video goes on and the, the teacher basically presents us the entire classroom and none of the children are, are in good mental health or none of the children are the ideal students in the vision of this uh, of this teacher. So what can we withdraw from this fictitious and tragic comic situation from this uh, from this video, this example that uh, that I'm giving you is that the teacher presents here a tendency of ascribing negative characteristics to each individual pupil, of course, and an individual centered approach where factors such as medical conditions, personality traits or family background are used to explain learning difficulties. And the possibility of having, for instance, unengaging classes or perhaps of children being in an unsafe learning environment or the pedagogical strategies being inadequate, that is never considered. It's always this individual personality or uh, other types of individual background that she points out. So the teacher seems to be seeking an envisioned ideal pupil who does not exist, that becomes clear by the end of the video, and deems the other student unteachable. So I think this video is a clear example of the failure in, acknowledge, in acknowledging the diversity that all of us who teach have in our classroom. So diversity in education is most often uh, cultural diversity, is seen as cultural diversity when we have students from different countries, when we have students with different, uh, from different ethnic groups or who speak different languages. In other cases, we consider diversity as being students that have different socioeconomic backgrounds and they study all in the same school and in the same classroom. But also, and this uh, becomes clear from this video example that I gave you, a diversity means having students with different needs, means having students with different life trajectories and having students with different interests, aspirations and dreams. So what I presented you in this uh, in this example is the, the, the fact that we often have in our educational systems and in our educational practice uh, deficit views and deficit views uh, mean that when we have diversity in the classroom and we identify it because that because that is not always the case. Sometimes we, we, we deal with diversity and we don't even acknowledge it. But when we do, uh, usually that becomes a problem. That becomes a problem that needs to be solved. Of course, not in an exaggerated and tragic comic way as depicted in this video, but that is often the mindset that we end up uh, reproducing. So problem oriented views um, in which the pupils who differ from the ideal type are seen as carriers, uh, carriers of numerous deficits that must be corrected are also deficit views. So this often leads to questionable pedagogical approaches that then might lead to loss of motivation, school disengagement, eventually dropout. And when that happens, they are usually coupled with what we call a blame the student perspective. So when when dropout happens or disengagement happens, then we could say, you know, very easily, oh, of course, that student was very rebellious, was very angry, was this or that, but not considering the, um, the wider uh, picture. Then the issue of assimilation is very important when, the, when we discuss diversity and we dis when we discuss education of migrants and refugees, of course, because deficit views are often linked to assimilation ideals where the expectation is that pupils who are perceived as different, and here migrant and refugee children uh, especially, are the ones who need to adapt to the local context, while host educational institutions can simply remain unchanged. And here we can look at different examples. For instance, when pupils not, do not speak the language of teaching, that is automatically transformed into a major issue. It doesn't matter if our migrant students speak one, two, three other languages fluently because they don't speak the right language, that becomes a problem. Uh, or when pupils are not familiar with the local academic culture and um, then we expect them to, to get familiar to it, to engage with our own academic culture, and we never question that perhaps there are elements in our own academic culture that we could change as well based on the example of, uh, of based on the examples that these students from different backgrounds and from different countries bring uh, to us. So a fundamental condition for an institutional switch from assimilationist uh, stances 
to a more multicultural perspective is to stop regarding difference as a deficit and to instead address diversity as an educational resource. Of course, this is something that is not very easy to, to do, but it is indeed very important in order to, to work with diversity in our classrooms. And as I have been ex explaining, all classrooms end up being diverse. So I would like now to bring your attention to this uh, model that was developed by some colleagues uh, from my, my university, um, namely uh, Luisa Curtizão and Stephen Stower, and they present us this uh, idea of the monocultural and the, the intercultural teacher. And of course, as you can imagine, the monocultural teacher is the one who usually uh, reproduces this deficit and assimilationist views and is not able to uh, deal with the diversity in the classroom. So some features of the monocultural, uh, monocultural teacher are um, this teacher is usually scientifically competent teacher and uh, masters disciplinary content and pedagogies of the subjects, values the acquisition of universal knowledge and cognitive development through learning. For this teacher, school is a neutral field of knowledge acquisition. Uh, this teacher also emerges as a source, as a transmitter uh, of knowledge and designs the teaching for the middle point, for the average. And usually students are represented uh, for this teacher in homogeneous groups. Also, this teacher is very much concerned about students' difficulties. So he or she are always looking to identify learning handicaps and difficulties. And uh, what frames the activity or uh, the intentions of this, uh, these teachers uh, are psychological and biological explanations for difficulties, difficulties at school that pupils might have. So very much aligned with the example that I gave you from the video. Um, then is a teacher who contributes to the construction of the ideal student and uses various motivation tools and compensatory formative assessments. So the implication, what moves uh, often the, the pedagogical action here is to understand students' existing handicaps. So very familiar uh, picture after what I just uh, presented. The intercultural teacher, on the other hand, is a teacher who is more vulnerable to doubt uh, the objective of the education is actually to shatter the teacher's own security and own knowledge and to question the causes of more or less positive results obtained by the students. As to, uh, at the theoretical level, it is important for the intercultural teacher to value the role of the school in the success and failure of the students, which is something that we, of course, did not see in the previous example. The teacher, um, multicultural intercultural teacher in this case, is able to investigate uh, social cultural characteristics of the context, um, is um, interested in analyzing problems arising from power relations at school, and understanding the school as a place of conflictual practices of intersection of different powers, interests, and values. And as we know, that is uh, uh, one of the best uh, descriptions of a school. Um, teachers, uh, intercultural teachers are able to investigate also the diversity that they have in the classroom. So first to take into account that they have that diversity and to investigate it. They identify and understand characteristics that inform uh, pupil heterogeneity. Um, they accept and use difference as a resource. Uh, intercultural teachers are also able to identify and analyze learning problems, so they put themselves into almost the hat of a researcher. So they question the, the, the appropriateness of content and methods and materials, and they want to understand if they suit the population they work with. So they differentiate the teaching. Of course, when we have diversity in the classroom, we have to have diverse pedagogical approaches as well. Um, so as a result, they design flexible work proposals and plans. So here we can see from, from this, uh, uh, there are the, this um, framework of the monocultural and intercultural teacher that I'm presenting you is more complex than this. I just selected a few elements to, to discuss today, but we can see that uh, the monocultural teacher is very much along the lines of the deficit views and the uh, assimilation ideals and the intercultural teacher more into the consideration of diversity and also acting upon that diversity and rendering it uh, a resource. 
So you might be wondering if you are a monocultural teacher or an intercultural teacher. Actually, I think that uh, these um, categories are not to be understood in uh, complete separation. So it is not that somebody is a monocultural teacher entirely or an intercultural teacher entirely, but I think it's a more uh, a matter of, um, of a continuum. So in our own practices, sometimes uh, when we never experienced a particular situation before, we might have um, an attitude or we might engage in, in a pedagogical practice that is very much monocultural. And in other occasions, we can also be uh, aligned with the, the intercultural uh, model. So it is a matter of um, continuously building uh, our, um, our experience and, and our teaching. Um, and again, becoming researchers of our own classrooms and then uh, moving along this axis. And I believe most uh, mostly towards the right end and towards becoming intercultural uh, teachers. So now, based on this uh, um, approach and this uh, uh, step back that uh, I invited you to, to take, um, let's think and let's answer to this question, how to become an intercultural teacher and welcome refugee children. So becoming an intercultural teacher is not important only for teachers who have migrant and refugee children in their classrooms. As noted before, I think it was very obvious that even apparently homogeneous classrooms are diverse. If we make an effort to notice that diversity, that this is a very important element. In other words, leaning towards a more inter intercultural pedagogy is beneficial for all students, regardless of their migratory background. So we often hear in ideological debates that, you know, all these multicultural ideals are like a left wing uh, agenda or something like that. Actually, what research shows us is that intercultural pedagogies are indeed uh, beneficial even in classrooms where we do not have the type of cultural diversity that, that you might think about. So none of our children could have a migratory background and it, it would still be relevant to reinforce an intercultural pedagogy in the sense that we are going to deal better with the different needs, the different aspirations, the different expectations, the different trajectories of our students. So an intercultural pedagogy is beneficial to all students because it fosters diversity, respect, communication, well-being, recognition, and most importantly, citizenship. It teaches citizenship values like tolerance, engagement, participation, and, uh, and so on. So whilst we acknowledge that diversity is a trait of every classroom, regardless of the migratory background of the pupils, it, all, it is also important to acknowledge that migrant and especially refugee pupils present particular trajectories and particular needs. And there, it is very important to consider migration processes. And migration processes and trajectories are extremely complex and they bring several consequences. And especially in the case of forced migration, which is the case of, of refugee children, they often bring um, consequences linked to confusion or uh, trauma. At the same time, it's also important in our teaching practice not to uh, make assumptions. So for instance, imagine that all refugee children are heavily traumatized and require intensive therapy just because they are refugees. Again, migratory trajectories can be very different, very diverse, and uh, uh, different children might require a different type of support or perhaps not even the support that we might initially think about, uh, as in this case I was mentioning therapy in the case of, of refugee children. So migratory and life trajectories are singular and need to be understood in their complexity. And here I quote uh, Franco Ferrarotti, who tells us that a person is never an individual. It would be better to call him or her a singular universe. I think this is a very strong um, uh, word and, and a very strong observation, a very powerful uh, observation that Ferrarotti makes here that uh, individuals are singular universes. So you, we can understand how complex are their realities, how complex are their experiences, their ideals, their needs, their trajectories. No, So we, we have to regard them as, as singular universes in, in that sense. And um, then another important element when, uh, when welcoming refugee children is also to actively observe and manage peer-to-peer -peer relations because we want to enhance well-being for all. Even if we have an um, intercultural approach to our classroom, 
other uh, peers might not have uh, that that approach. As you as you could see, six year old children can be very aggressive uh, and based on the assumptions that they hold about uh, about their colleagues uh, can end up in engaging in uh, in not very uh, not very good behavior as we saw at the beginning with the example uh, of the of the article the newspaper article and um, uh, last it is important to be mindful that when implementing an intercultural approach to teaching and learning you might experience some resistance because there are wider societal forces for instance, systemic racism and uh, uh, scholars that have been working with this topic uh, keep uh, warning us that there are other forces uh, that even when teachers have good intentions, the, the system is structured in, in, in a rather monocultural way that do, do not allow us uh, to, to take care of the diversity that we have in our classrooms. And I think the best way to uh, surpass this limitation is to engage in a whole school approach where um, intercultural and diversity approaches should go beyond the classroom. They should include parents, they should include other school actors and the entire school community. And I think this is what I wanted to share with you today. And I am a little bit above my time because I am counting uh, my own time, but I just want to leave you with this uh, note. For more practical examples, you can go to the School Education Gateway and uh, I'm going to share the link in the chat where you will find these resources that Teresa has mentioned. And of course, refer to the European Toolkit for Schools. And the European Toolkit for Schools, as you might know, is a platform for uh, uh, promising practice that um, uh, are being implemented in, uh, in schools all over Europe and beyond. And that can be very inspiring for you when thinking about these issues of migrant children, refugee children and diversity issues in education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasmin. I think that all the comments in the chat are uh, uh, raising and saying that this has been very clarifying. So thank you for providing us this introductory note uh, to the next speakers. So now we are going to move from uh, Portugal to Italy again. Uh, so Sara Madassi, uh, who is a research fellow in the Department of Studies and Language and Culture at the University of Modena in Reggio Emilia, uh, will be presenting on the Child Lab project. Uh, her research interests concern the promotion of children's participation in intercultural communication and transnational migrations. And together with Professor Adrian Holiday, she's the author of the book Making Sense of the Intercultural, Finding Decentered Threats, uh, published in Rowledge. So, Sara, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm here to um, tell you something more about Child Up, who is an Horizon 2020 uh, project. It's uh, coordinated by um, Professor Claudio Baraldi in the Department of Studies on Language and Culture, University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, and this is the consortium. Um, three of these partners are research uh, in, 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 institutes of research uh, partners and uh, the other seven are um, partners in which the research was carried out in their countries. So the general aims of Child Up, they are uh, mainly two. The first one is to investigate the possibilities and opportunities of children having a, a migration background to participate uh, in processes that uh, uh, can change their social and cultural conditions of hybrid integration. Later on, I will uh, go back to this concept of hybrid integration and I will say something more. The second aim is to propose uh, practical me methodologies and tools to support and improve practices of hybrid integration in the education system and also to promote dialogue and to promote agency of children having a migration background but not only children having migration background uh, three main concepts of child up are uh, facilitation agency and hybrid integration so what do we refer to when we mm, talk about facilitation facilitation is a dialogic form of communication. It means that uh, while doing facilitation, 
there is a the, the, the hierarchy of roles and expectations uh, of the education system are challenged. challenged. And uh, um, the, the roles between adults and children uh, usually um, um, common in the education system are challenged. So uh, children are supported in their personal expression, in their personal stories, in telling their personal stories. And this, is, this, means, this means, sorry, to promote uh, their agency. Uh, agency is a form of participation which is based on the choices of action that are available to children. So through these uh, actions, to, by, by choosing different actions, children um, are active in promoting a, a change uh, which concern their social and cultural conditions. Facilitating hybrid integration means to produce forms of hybrid integration which are based on the interlacement of several narratives. The different narratives that children want to tell and that concern their personal cultural trajectories, their personal stories. Hybrid integration, here it is, um, is based on uh, the mixing of facilitation and agency. Facilitation and agency um, lead to a production of narratives in classroom communication. And uh, these narratives uh, reach the environment because they, um, they, they bring to the classroom a variety, they present to the classroom a variety of situations and a variety of personal stories. Um, it is also important to say that within Child Up, um, the idea of hybrid identity is different from the idea of children just having uh, different culture, cultures or um, having access to different cultural um, identities, because identity is not Cultural identity is not perceived as something which is reified, which characterize um, the, the, the individual always and in all situation, but as something which is constructed contingently, which is fluid. And so that changes on the basis of the interactional needs and the personal needs of uh, the participants, and in this case of children. So after uh, some um, information about the, the theoretical framework, um, I uh, say a couple of words about the methodology because Child Up um, applied a mixed method uh, research. So uh, we delivered uh, questionnaires. Uh, we collected also uh, audio and video recordings of school activities and uh, focus groups and interviews with children and professionals were carried out, uh, were carried on. Uh, professionals uh, um, include uh, teachers, mediators, and social workers. And uh, the research was um, included the schools from preschool and um, higher secondary schools. These are some of the number of the participants to the research. So, uh, we involved almost uh, 4,000 children, uh, more than 2,000 parents, and more than 400 uh, teachers in seven countries, which are Bil Belgium, Finland, Germany, Italy, Poland, Sweden, and UK. We recorded 200, almost more than 200 activities in classroom, and we also audio recorded some meetings, um, mediation meetings, uh, between teachers and parents, and in some of these meetings, also children attended. So what's the relevance of uh, Child Up for migrants and refugees? Uh, through Child Up, facilitation was uh, proposed as a method. And uh, through the method of facilitation, agency becomes, um, uh, is recognized as an active way through which uh, children can change, can contribute, and can um, take choices 
concerning uh, changes of their personal conditions. Um, the hybridity of the personal stories is a uh, giving relevance to this hybridity, hybridity is a way to um, foster, to announce the inclusion in schools and, com and community, especially because the hybridity of the personal stories is the hybridity of the personal stories of every child, not just migrant or refugees uh, children. And also um, mediation and interpreting was conceived as a way to facilitate children's agency. OK, uh, now I would like to show you two um, empirical examples of um, interactions that we recorded. Uh, so in a couple of minutes, I will um, I will present to you these excerpts. Uh, the first one is uh, taken from a primary school in London. And it's a discussion about personal experiences and family memories of war. Uh, the narratives produced by uh, children and especially one, chi one child, which is M1. Uh, of course, we, um, we, we um, deleted all the, the name and we just included codes. Uh, these uh, narratives influence the developments um, the, uh, these narratives influence the development of the conversation. The second excerpt uh, was recorded in an Italian secondary school, and the activity uh, that was done and recorded uh, remotely because of the pandemic consisted in producing narratives on relations, conflict, and inclusion in the classroom. And children were asked to uh, produce some drawings and to present these drawings to the classroom and then to start with uh, the, uh, a discussion. So now I have to uh, go out from this presentation to share with you uh, the extract because they are quite long and it wasn't possible to to include them in the um, in the PowerPoint. Can you see the extract? Yes. Great. OK, so I'm not going to read everything because it's very long, but um, I just to give you um, the context, I will read uh, the first turns. Uh, so um, uh, a group work has just uh, ended and M1 is presenting is presenting what the group uh, discussed about. And uh, um, he says that from uh, M2 point of view, you know how England is a very first world country. Sometimes they want more than they have, so they take from poor countries which have good resources. No offense, but England is like a first world country, but it isn't well resourced in like uh, food and other stuff. So they take from different countries so people started to think that they didn't want to do that. So that's how war broke out. So this is the participant. TM means teacher and uh, is a male. The others uh, are participants. Uh, M uh, um, stands for male, male number one, so is a child. And F stands for uh, female one or two and is a female and always a child. So um, here a discussion between the teacher and M1 starts and um, M1 in turn three introduce the topic of war uh, in his own family's country, which is Sierra Leone. And he says, like in my country, in my family's country, Sierra Leone. So the teacher um, adds a comment and then move to a question which is very important because with this um, the teacher with this question open the floor to m1 narrative so he asks uh, and some people are trying to keep it to themselves and that's how the word break loose so m1 goes on with his uh, narrative uh, turn six is a very long turn of the teacher and you can see it 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 doesn't produce a good reaction from from the children. Uh, 
but in turn eight, the teacher um, again intervenes to say something, uh, to ask a question. In this uh, turn, he admits um, that he doesn't know the, uh, the date of the start of the war in Sierra Leone, and he asks this question to, to the students. So he says, that word was probably, I don't know, do you, do you know? So in this way, he's giving the possibility to the student to, um, to, to, to contribute to the knowledge construction together with the, the group and the classroom. So in turn nine, M1 says it was 1997 because that's what my family was telling me about. And again, the teachers ask something end of 1997 to children. Do you know how long it spent for? My mom said it was something like seven, five years. You can see in turn uh, 12 that the teachers, the teacher doesn't comment uh, um, M1 uh, claims with an evaluation, uh, an educate, uh, an, um, with an evaluation of what M1 said. He just re, uh, repeat what M1 said. So he says seven, five years, and then add a comment, which has nothing to do with it, any kind of evaluation to M1 um, claims. Um, the turns goes on. And again, in um, turn 19, intervenes, uh, another, another student intervenes. He is M3 and he says, Mr. In Afghanistan, my granddad always says that they tried to get, I think, uh, resources or something. They said no, but then it was a war a long time before this one. I think it was for less than 20 years and uh, 1 million uh, 500 people died. Again, the teacher says um, nothing. I mean, he doesn't evaluate um the, the the comment of m3 and he says but again it's a word about natu natural resources by the sound of of things and money so what's driving these they goes on by commenting these uh events and um i try to go a bit uh, faster in turn um 34 and 35 in turn 34, M1 says exactly the same as Sierra Leone. And in turn 35, the teacher just repeat um, what M1 just said with no any kind of educative um, evaluation. In turn 36, M1 intervenes again and he comments by saying, but they didn't have their independence taken like Afghanistan, I think. My mom told me that they uh, go there, that they got their independence in like 1970 um, 70 something. And in terms uh, 38, 39, 40 and 41, something uh, good happens because children here are moving from one intervention to the other without uh, the, the teachers giving them the floor, just autonomously, they take the floor and they comment. And again, and lastly, in turn 42, the teacher asks confirmation of what he's saying to M6. So he says, uh, they have been at war for ages over who owns which bit of the country, Kosovo and Serbia, haven't they, M6. So she gives, uh, he gives again the uh, knowledge production to the students. The second excerpt is different uh, and much shorter uh, because uh, here the girl is just explaining her feelings about uh, the drawings that she um, just produced. And, uh, but again, the intervention of the facilitator is very important because she gives the floor to the girls to express herself completely. Um, so in turn three, the girl starts to explain about, to, to make an explanation of her drawing. And she says, so well, 
Uh, so practically, there is an important date, uh, 2017, which is when I met my best friend. Then there is a house which is in Manila with three people, which would be uh, my grandparents and me, who practically they are the most important people because they are like uh, family, like my second family, like my parents, because they raised me as a child. So for me, they are parents. The facilitator intervenes just by saying, sure. And so the floor again is left to the girl. And then, well, there is a heart. That means that for me, they are family. It's the most important thing that the things that comes first. Nothing, mm, I finished. Here, the facilitator intervenes to comment, but again, uh, also this facil facilitator doesn't evaluate uh, at all the intervention of the girl. She just limits herself to say, uh, you have been very clear. So she makes an appreciation of what the girl just said. Therefore, the family, also the grandparents, because they are all those who have been close to you and have helped you to grow. So she formulates, uh, she summarizes what the girl just said. And the girl replied, yes. And then in, turns, uh, in turn nine, the girl goes on. She says, yes, the people who have always been close to me in the difficult moment, I mean, in fact, my best friend has been a very important person who has always been close to me, always, always. So for me, she is the sister that I'm, a sister that I lost when I, when I was a little, a child. Um, she was practically my twin sister that I lost. So she's like my sister because she has always been close to me and she supports me in everything. She's very precious. It's very nice, the facilitator replies. So again, she's appreciating the effort for the, the emotional uh, explanation that the girl said, um, did. And then she, she thanked the girl. Thank you, uh, F6. Thank you for sharing even the most difficult things. You're welcome. Okay, so now I switch back to. The PowerPoint. Do you see it? Yes. OK, great. OK, so some important results from the data. The first one is um, that we can see the teacher support of children's possibility to make choices concerning the narratives they want to tell and the way they want to tell them. So this is done through dialogue, empathy, and signs of listening. Uh, the teachers stimulate trust, free, free expression of own feelings and thoughts, and they negotiate together with the children the rules and how to shape the social relations uh, they are involved in uh, according to students' need, to the students' need. They enhance children's participation and autonomy without a victimization of those who come from a war experiences, but just evaluating, uh, but just um, um, giving value to their uh, knowledge. And they create uh, connections and spaces for children who live similar experiences, even if in other parts of the world and in other, uh, on other circumstances. So facilitating dialogue um, and children personal expression is done through uh, some uh, specific actions. For example, questions which enhance participation, formulations which summarize, explicate or develop the meaning of what children just said, or minimal responses which show listening and attention, but at the same time focus on the fluidity on, of the conversations and give 
uh, space for children to go deeper into their narratives. Um, through facilitation, children are treated as experts of their own experiences um, and their feeling and the social life they are living. So there is an upgrading of their epistemic authority, which means the uh, set of rights and responsibilities in knowledge production within the classroom. It's not just the teacher who has the right to produce knowledge, but these rights are shared between the adult and the children. OK, uh, these are some of the relevant outputs that uh, will come out of uh, Child Up. So um, an archive is going to be ready very soon and it will be it will collect all uh, some of these interactions and some of the interviews, the, the extract of the interviews and data that we collected through questionnaires. Uh, there will also be um, guidelines for facilitation by the end of May, which are based on the analysis of best practices across the, the several partners uh, um, in the European partners and a training package for professionals training. This is done to operationalize the methodological guidelines. And finally, uh, there will be also always by the end of May, a MOOC, a massive open online course to distribute the training to a European wide, uh, wide audience. And in this uh, MOOC, the materials will consist of video lectures, interactive workshops to analyze examples from best practices based on the content, on the content of the lectures, slides and tools for self-assessment of learning. All these um, outputs will be uh, translated in the seven languages of the, of the partners uh, of the consortium. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, for this excellent and very insightful uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of questions that are already in the chat. So we will move to the last but not least uh, presentation that will be uh, by the hand by Matija and Barbara. I'm going to introduce both of them. They are going to share the, their presentation. So Matija Setmak is a PhD in sociology and she's the principal research associate and the head of the Institute for Social Science at the Science and Research Center Koper in Slovenia. Uh, her research interests include ethnic and intercultural studies, migration, management of cultural diversity and topics in sociology of everyday life and sociology of the family. Uh, she's the head of the section for intercultural studies at the Slovenian Sociological Society and the leader for many national and international projects, including the Horizon 2020 MiCreate uh, project, Migrant Children and Communities and a Transformative in a tra and a transforming Europe uh, that she will be with Barbara presenting. And Barbara Gornick, uh, she's a research associate at the Science and Research Center of Koper. Uh, her research interests are migration, nationalism and human rights, uh, which she studies using the anthropology of human rights and discourse theory as basic theoretical standpoints to explain the implementation and interpretation of human rights as an effect of knowledge and power relations. She works as an academic coordinator of the MiCreate uh, project and uh, she has published work dealing with asylum, refugees, migrant children, international human rights law and many other issues. So the floor is uh, for both of you. Thank you, Thank Teresa. You. Uh, I seem to have some problems with sharing this. OK, so we did have uh, <laughs> A testing. We, yes, we did the testing. test. <laughs> so uh, maybe Paula can share it instead of you on your behalf. Yes, that would be great. I don't see Anina. No, it does not work. It doesn't work. No. OK, Paula, she has. Now we, now we are seeing your, your screen. Your uh -huh. screen. Okay. Yeah. okay, just a second. Okay, so now because I cannot see you, but 
You can okay. see. Yeah. You can see. Uh, we yeah. can we can see the oh. the cover okay, page. Great. I'm glad that we found a way. So thank you for inviting us. Uh, we are uh, very happy to be here and to share our project results with this uh, on this very important topic. Um, as you already mentioned, um, we are um, coordinators of the Horizon 2020 project. Um, it is entitled Migrant Children and Communities in the Transforming Europe. Um, and this project is basically a research about uh, how integration of migrant children happens at the level of policy, but also in concrete social relations. Um, in this presentation, we would like to give really a brief presentation how the uh, Migrate project was implemented and how, what are the, its main basic starting points. And then my colleague will uh, uh, present tools for inclusive education specifically the ones that we have developed within the project, that is uh, IC Tools Digital Storytelling Application and another one uh, which is called Awareness Rising Tool. And the third one is about Handbook for Teachers, which has different topics. Uh, if we have time at the end, we would also like to share with you a video with key policy recommendations, but we will see that at the end. So uh, just a few things about the project. Um, uh, similar than the Child Up project, our is also included a very big consortium. We had 15 academic institutions and NGOs from 12 European countries, and more than 70 researchers were involved in these activities. We started in January 2019, and we will end in a couple of months, that is in June 2020. Uh, so as I already mentioned, we wanted to learn about more about how um, integration of migrant children happens. Uh, this is why the majority or the, the main focus of our project was actually research uh, with children, but also with other stakeholders. Uh, research with children uh, in schools took place from September 2019 and concluded in September 2021. It was a rather long period for research because we um, we were uh, facing certain challenges because of the COVID restrictions and we had uh, difficulties in accessing the sites, schools were closed and so on. Um, so, but nevertheless, the research took place in uh, 10 different countries. Uh, Excuse that me, Matija, sorry. Uh, Paula, can you move to the next slide? Because we are only seeing the cover page, the first page. And maybe you can put it in a presenter mode. Sorry, we have these small technical issues. Give her Paula speak. I see that it is opened from the browser. Perhaps it can be downloaded and then it's easier to open it. Mm. Paola, do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I'll um sharing for a second and I'll see if I Okay. Sorry, Paola, Okay, now now it's perfect. Yeah, we can see the cover page. If yeah, now you can also take control right. of the presentation. Can you see take control? Yeah, yeah, I have control now. Thank you. You're Thank you. OK, so um, back to uh, yeah, I stopped here. So um, the research took place in schools in Denmark, Spain, UK, Austria, Slovenia and Poland. Whereas in Italy, France, Greece and Turkey, we also did research uh, in asylum homes, reception centers and camps, refugee camps. Um, the unique approach in our project, I believe it was that we devoted quite a lot of time to participant observation. Uh, this is very important. This was very important for us because we wanted to gain some trust for ch from children. We wanted to first build some kind of relationship to spend as much time with them as possible before inviting them to their interview. 
So because we believe that in this way we will obtain uh, more honest answers and not to gain something that children think they should tell to the researchers. Some of us also applied art based approach, uh, but mainly we uh, collected their um, autobiographical stories through interviews, but also through focus groups. Uh, in addition, we also implemented a survey. Um, so the sample was uh, that we included more than 6,000 migrant and local children in the survey and had an interview with more than 500 local and migrant children. Um, also, as you can see, uh, more than 500 uh, educational staff and teachers were involved in more than 40 schools. As you can see here, uh, we tended to um, include migrant and local children into the research because we honestly believe that um, integration depends on both on the local community uh, and depending on how it is receptive towards migrants and then of course on also on the uh, on the migrant themselves. So uh, we followed this approach to include local children in our research as well. Uh, one of the basic starting points or the, the uh, key orientation of our researchers that we wanted to apply to child-centered approach. This means that we wanted to include children's voices and perspectives into interpretation of um, in integration or other social phenomenon. Um, so we wanted to learn more about how children experiences experience and describe their own lives. <coughs> What is important to them in their lives? How do they understand integration? What are the challenges they are facing? And what is important for their well-being according to their priorities and so on? So as you can see here, the child-centered approach in our case focused mainly on focus on their well-being, uh, which was explored based on the participation and involvement of children into research. Uh, our research aims was to encourage integration of different groups of migrant children with adopting this so-called child-centered approach. So we wanted to uh, use it into research, education and policy. Um, but overall, we wanted to gain new knowledge about, how, uh, about the peer dynamics in school and how this integration happens in a real uh, relationship. Uh, based on this research we did with children, we wanted to uh, develop practical tools which uh, could be of help uh, to, for uh, teachers to use in the, their classrooms. So in this way, we wanted to uh, enhance capacity of teachers to, uh, for diversity management. But also based on the research, we also wanted to develop uh, child-centered policy recommendations. Uh, I will skip this. So, as already mentioned, there are uh, three... I'm sorry, Barbara, I think I believe you didn't take control of uh, the slide, but we can see slide number six. Take control. Can you please... Now it, I see seven, eight. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I will now uh, give floor to my colleague who will present digital story application and handbook for teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon also on my behalf, so I will try to be effective in presenting our presentation. So as Barbara mentioned, um, we developed you know, some of the tools which I will present now. Uh, can you see the slide with digital storytelling tool? OK, yes. thank you very much. So this is how this digital storytelling tool looks. It can be used on the computer, on, on uh, tablets. And uh, the idea, you know, with this digital storytelling tool is that we um, give the possibility to children to create their visual and written stories because, you know, the children are now living in this digital world. So we try to uh, to to be um, in line with uh, their lives. But what is important here that it, it's it doesn't it's not important the language knowledge of the children. This means that you know the children can express themselves regardless of the language skills. Those who doesn't speak the local language can use mostly the object, the um, the and the pictures you know from these digital storytelling tools. Those who, who are I don't know familiar with some words can use 
simply words or sentences and those who want can really write uh, long stories essays reflections or dictionaries so uh, the content it's not predefined this means that the teacher can or cannot start with some you know uh, uh, starting points for example teaching can, can use some minority literature for youth and then stimulate the children local and migrant to reflect on the topic and this can be a starting point you know for the reflection about the topics related to the multiculturality migration integration and so on the aim of the digital storytelling tool is actually on one hand to give a space to children to ex express themselves you know in a written way or in other other forms more visual and also to give a space uh, to the teacher and to the children to, to, to discuss about the topic related to the integration and migration. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so this uh, story that the, that the children develop can be printable in the uh, PDF files. Uh, this digital story tool can be uh, accessible via our and is supported in English, Slovenian, Danish, German, Spanish and Polish language for now. The other uh, ICT tool is so-called Awareness Rising application. How it looks, it can be, see, uh, can be um, seen uh, from this picture. The title is Multiculturality in Schools and can be used individually or collectively in, in the classroom uh, via uh, mobile phones. At the beginning, children choose a language. Here we have the support of CIS languages that were involved in, our, in, the, in the development of this app. And here we can actually find 13 uh, animated interactive videos. Uh, which are dealing with different topics. So these videos are very diverse, you know, but they are all focusing on the issues related to migration, challenges with integration, as for example, discrimination, racism, language learning, acceptance in the, in the classroom or non-acceptance and so on. And the users are uh, encouraged to, uh, to, to be more active and they are invited to reply to the quiz questions. There are also some reflective questions in relation to the, to the stories and there are also split story lines. This means that if you choose one answer, then the story ends in one way. If you choose the other uh, uh, um, answer, then the story, uh, you know, ends in the other way. This is this awareness rising um, tool can be also used as a starting point for the further discussion you know among teachers and the class uh, in relation to the uh, to the multicultural issues and is uh, also supported for now in English Slovenian Danish German Spanish and Polish language it can be used we are as we say we as we can see Google Play or App Store Okay, the last one I want to present you very shortly is a handbook for teachers with the title Living in the Multicultural Schools. These are actually the collections of the good practices from all around the Europe. And this handbook um, has uh, four chapters plus indicators for measurement of children well-being. In these four chapters, we are addressing different, you know, uh, areas. The first one is actually a collection of the practices for multicultural education and diversity management. The second one, uh, the second chapter is the collection of practices for solving interactive conflicts in the school environment. The third one is the collection of art-based practices and approaches that can be used by, by teacher in the class. And then the fourth one is collection of best practices related to the organization of everyday life in multicultural schools. And the last one, uh, um, uh, the last chapter is including the indicators that, are, that with, with uh, uh, and with these indicators, we are actually measuring the well-being of the children, their level of integration, and also uh, how this uh, integration and well-being is changing through time. Uh, in each chapter, there are 13 uh, practices 
And as mentioned, they were collected all around the Europe. So this means that they are reflecting the realities of different states, of different schools, and of different cultural environments. And uh, what we, what I also want to emphasize is that we ask children advisory boards from our, you know, partners groups to help us to develop these practices, to choose these practices, to level, to develop them in a way that they are the most, you know, suitable to the reality how they how they see it. And also, all these practices were piloted in the concrete schools among different age groups in the primary and secondary schools in six countries across the Europe. For now, handbooks are, in, uh, are available in English, Slovenian, Danish, German, Spanish and Polish language. We are thinking about to, to translate it in some other languages. However, this is also in related to the time and to the, of course, finances. The very final versions, we will have it on web page in June 2022. This is how these handbooks will look at the end. Here we have the, the, the handbook in the Polish language, which is uh, uh, finished now, as we can see. You know, we will have also different colors for different, you know, chapters for, I don't know, for the chapter re, uh, resolving inter-ethnic inter conflicts will be in one color, uh, how to organize everyday life in multicultural school in other color so that it will be easily, you know, um, located which uh, practice we search for. And then in the final chapter, we, we have these indicators of migrant conceptualization of well-being. As I said, it can be used by a teacher or by the schools uh, for periodical measurement of the well-being of migrant children, the level of their integration, but also to evaluate the existing school measures. There are two sets of indicator, indicators included in this, uh, in this chapter. The first refer to the migrant children and the second to the school environment. And for each indicator, there, there is a description, a guiding questions for the indicators, and also a measurement tools. And here, just to show you very concretely, for example, a questionnaire for the children, example, how concrete question looks. We also use this Smiley. smileys, so they, it, it can be a little bit easier for the younger children to, to, to use it. And then we, we have also the, an example uh, for the educators, how they can evaluate their own schools, guiding questions as, for example, are there any learning support measures available in the schools? Yes, no. Are the, I don't know, psychosociological services and so on. So there are questions that, that evaluate the, the state in the concrete schools uh, from the integration perspective. So if you if you um, want to have some more information about our work, you can look at our web page, you can contact us directly. Um, and we have also this promoting five minutes video where we collected the key recommendations, but I'm not sure if you have time. So I would like to finish here, but if we have time, I'm asking uh, the organizers of this webinar to tell us we can show also the promoting video, but if we don't have time, it's, it's fine anyway, because it can be found on our web page. OK, okay. Uh, thank you, Matija. Maybe we can share the link of the video in the chat and start mm -hmm. the conversation and the debate. OK, thank you very Is much. Is that fine? Yeah. Yes, yes, perfect. OK, thank you. I think that uh, this has been an incredible uh, wealth of information of the two projects and the introductionary remarks. Um, I think looking at the chat, there are a lot of interest among our uh, audience <laughs> to ask questions. I already identified different questions for uh, for um, our speakers, so maybe I will start uh, uh posting them to the speakers but uh, of course i encourage all the the people who are following us from many different parts of europe uh to write their questions in the chat so we can uh read them upload and, and address them so the first question was for cosme and it was uh posted by the european parents association and uh at, when, while you were 
talking and presenting, they were asking if what of the the model that you were presenting would fall in the line with inclusive and transformative education. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you for the, for this question. Uh, is, it is indeed very much uh, aligned with the logics of including and, and transformative uh, education. Um, and actually, in this uh, in this presentation, as I was telling you, it was more like an invitation of uh, of taking this this step back and reflecting upon uh, upon diversity. Uh, in education in the more uh, general sense, but then of course there are uh, a lot of issues that we could discuss for, for hours, especially looking just at this table of the monocultural and then the intercultural teacher, and there, there were comments uh, on, on that as well. Um, and I think that one of the dimensions that uh, is very visible in this um, intercultural logic and the intercultural teacher uh, description is the ability to reflect upon his or her own uh, practices and to, to analyze the, um, the classroom, to conduct uh, some sort of a research of what is going on in the classroom. And this is a very important element also of transformative learning when we reflect upon our own experience and then we reach new meanings and we reach new understandings of our own practices and our own actions. So it's uh, very much aligned with, uh, with this theory indeed. Thank you, Cosmin. I don't know if the other speakers want to add anything. Should we move to the next question? Uh, one question that was, um, uh, posed to Sara and a lot of questions were around the facilitation uh, concept that you were showing through the script uh, was if uh, if if one person that uh, didn't uh, it doesn't show the name here in the chat uh, said uh, that are we examining here that we should encourage people to express their feelings so maybe if you want to to clarify and to complement this uh, notion of facilitation, which is the. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you to the person who asked this question. Um, yeah, I think um, one the focus is, um, of course, feelings are important, but also on personal stories. So to give a space in school even in school to for children to share uh, their personal stories and their personal narratives. So this um, is a way to break that uh, division between roles and to focus on on person, which means also feelings and uh, views, uh, personal perspectives. So yeah, I would rather talk about personal stories because it's a wider um, category that includes also feelings. Okay, thank you, Sarah. I think that this is uh, very much aligned with the the Me Create project because you are also working a lot with sharing these uh, personal stories. So maybe you want to also to to add about. Uh, uh, the storytelling and the other tools that are very much based on on sharing the, the experiences and the stories of these children and their families. We cannot hear you. You are mute. Well, actually, the, the idea behind the storytelling application is exactly this, you know, we wanted to create a, a tool that will um, enable migrant children and local children together to, to create stories, to express themselves, but also, uh, as already Matea explained, you know, to use it as a pedag pedagogical tool for intercultural uh, discussions, for example, I don't know, uh, children can make summaries of, of uh, some literature from home they would like to talk about or something. Or we even thought um, it uh, it should be stressed that they can use their own language, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not, not necessarily to be the language of the whole society, so that uh, the the identity or the um, of the children is kind of valued, you know, in this sense. Uh, we tested this um, we te we tested this in schools and we 
um, had a really positive reply uh, response from children. Um, and they, we saw very different ways how they used it. Mm -hmm. uh, some that we didn't even imagine that that could be used, you know, as a discussion pro and contra, for example, between different arguments or, I don't know, sending invitations. Uh, so, yeah, it was a way of creativity because also um, creativity uh, and input of children is something that is uh, basically a starting point of the child-centered approach we uh, we adopted in our project. So this is the participation of children, creativity, development of skills, language learning, all this together comes with the digital storytelling application. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, there is a general question posed to to all the speakers, and it refers of on how um, not only teachers but also school authorities, school directors, and other school professionals should be open in these useful tools, and see beyond the completion of curriculum. So maybe from both projects, or even Cosmin from his experience, can uh, address this question of how to involve all the administrators and the other staff of, of the educational centers, the the teachers. Um, I can uh, I can start if that's OK. Um, I think this is uh, very much in line with uh, with one of the last points that uh, that I was making in my presentation that um, when you are uh, trying to work towards the implementation of this uh, intercultural pedagogy and trying to respect diversity and value diversity in your classroom, sometimes you might actually face resistance from uh, from the wider school structures. So this is uh, actually something that we see um, in practice uh, in, in the schools that uh, that we, we work with. Uh, um, it uh, it becomes uh, visible sometimes that um, it is not easy to to take uh, the, the school administration or uh, or other relevant school actors on board. Um, but then, of course, it is a matter of um, of mutual learning. No, and I think that there are many opportunities in our school settings in which we, we learn from each other and we, we collaborate. And then we can also bring these uh, issues uh, into the table. And I think one of the uh, the best arguments uh, to, to this is precisely this uh, realization and recognition that uh, cultural diversity or diversity in general is not something that uh, is uh, strictly about migrant or refugee children, but it is about all our children. So once we start understanding these children in their complexity, in their diversity, um, it's only there that uh, that we can actually engage with uh, with this uh, mindset and with these uh, pedagogical practices. And if we work towards uh, uh, a diverse and an intercultural environment in our schools, all students will benefit, and not only the migrants. And of course, the migrants as well. And that is a very important topic. But it is not um, sectorial or uh, an isolated uh, effort. I think this is the uh, one of the best arguments that we can use in this process. Thank you. Maybe from the Child App project, Sarah, do you want to share how you have worked with all, also these actors, these important actors? Yeah, I, I agree with Cosmin because it's not always easy and sometimes you have to face some yeah, doubts on these kind of methods. Um, I think um, for example, the pandemic was very um, important to do uh, to 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 uh, force to a change, or at least uh, to force to for a reflection to ask people to reflect on how to uh, permit children to express themselves uh, in a situation in which uh, things were moving so fast and adults were taking all these choices that children weren't really considered, you know, and uh, many people working in school, I think they had to face the fact that children were leaving uh, a, a moment of great frustration and, uh, and difficulties. Uh, of course, not uh, in every educational context, I think uh, people reacted uh, positively to these difficulties, but we um, 
um, encountered some situations in which the teacher uh, welcomed very uh, happily our intervention because they thought that could be a moment in which uh, children had the opportunity that were um, they 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 were weren't having in that moment to express themselves and to share their own narratives in a moment in which the narratives were mainly produced by adults. So yeah. Thank you, Sarah. So maybe now we can address like the last question that we'll be able to to respond today, and maybe the the colleagues from the MeCreate project and Stuart Hunter ask, how do we take the classroom experience out of the community more effectively? So I didn't know if you have uh, also worked with families and the community in the testing and piloting of, of all these practices and tools. Are you asking us, Teresa? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, we were mostly involved in the in the work within the schools. So uh, we were not so, you know, uh, active outside the schools, uh, regardless of the fact that we fully, you know, uh, uh, agree that it is really important to involve also the local community, parents and so on, you know. But uh, actually our uh, tools were generated for the school environment. But um, if I may relate to the, your previous, you know, question, uh, I would say that what we found out in all our research, you know, in different countries is that it's really depend if we are, you know, in the uh, uh, local environments with the longer tradition of multiculturality, then it's much easier to involve, you know, uh, other stakeholders, you know, the whole school community, local community and so on. The biggest problem is with the local communities, which until now didn't have, you know, so much um, um, uh, experiences with multi multicultural realities. However, you know, the multiculturality of the Europe is a fact. This is not not something we, we can choose, it's not something that will happen. And from our perspective, you know, the first thing really, really important is information about all these things as Cosmin presented now today, you know, all these theoretical, you know, starting points. And on the other hand, we, we realized that sometimes it was a turning point when we faced, you know, the, with the principals and local communities with, with the fact that if we all of us, you know, not only migrant people, but all of us, if we want to live in the environment which is safe, uh, which is, um, you know, which is accepting and so on, it is really important that we address multiculturality and this intercultural acceptance. Because at the end of the end, if we ignore multiculturality, if we don't want to recognize the presence of the refugee and migrant children and adults, then at the end, you know, we are facing the future that it will be, you know, um, um, exclusive, where there will be segregation, where there will be ghettoization and so, so on. And nobody wants actually to live in such a society, you know, which is segregate, which is dividing and so on. So it's really important that we realize that this is our present, this is our future, and that we must, you know, accept to be living in such a, you know, diverse society in many ways. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, I think that uh, I don't know if uh, Sarah or Cosmin want to have a final word or the team of me create Barbara and Matija. No, so I think that we can uh, leave it here. There are a lot of positive comments in the chat and also there has been a lot of sharing of resources, links uh, to platforms, to working groups, to webinars. So uh, we encourage to revise this chat because a lot of information has been shared here. Interesting information. Also the two uh, websites for the two projects that have been presented today. Uh, I think that we can finish here this really, really, really interesting and important and and timing uh, uh, webinar thank you all for for your uh, participation and just to have a nice weekend to all the all the people who are sharing with us this afternoon thank you thank, thank you. you thank you Teresa thank you, thank you Teresa